I just wanted to give a, a, a brief background to why I wrote a book called The Idle Parent. And really it goes back to when I was a very lazy, even lazier than I am now, 25-year-old um, wannabe freelance journalist living in London. And um, every day I'd wake up and, uh, and think, right, I've got to get up, work hard, um, get out of bed, uh, get my ideas off to the commissioning editors and, um, you know, be dynamic. And what happened to me every day was that I would lie in bed in this kind of pit of uh, self-hatred, um, unable to get out of bed, uh, but sort of telling myself what a terrible person I was for not working harder. And then also resolving every New Year's Eve to wake up earlier. Next year I'm going to wake up every day at 8 o'clock and so I can get more done. Um, and I was in the middle of this sort of uh, confusion, if you like, when I read a series of essays by Dr. Johnson, who is the great lexicographer and uh, man of letters of the 18th century, famous for wandering around 18th century London with um, James Boswell, being witty in the taverns, um, with uh, people like Topham Beauclerk and the other young rakes of London town. Um, and he was also part of that really quite exciting period in English journalism where people were making money from their writing. There was an absolute explosion of periodicals at the time with titles like The Rambler, The Spectator, uh, The Observer. So you have this idea of a, a sort of journalist around town who wanders around the coffee houses, taking notes, reporting in the papers, uh, his columns, and people enjoying, are enjoying reading these. Um, but in the middle of all this, Dr. Johnson wrote a series of essays called The Idler. And in this, he celebrated or at least explored his own personality, which was simultaneously um, creative and ambitious, uh, but also extremely constitutionally lazy. <laughs> and um, I read his essays and diaries, and he said every New Year's Eve and every birthday, I resolve henceforward to rise earlier. Um, if I resolve to rise at 8, I might actually rise at 10, and that's better than the 12 o'clock, uh, which is when I currently do rise and so on. And he made his resolutions all through his life, and never really got the hang of it. And when he worked, he would work at great speed, close to the deadline. Um, and so the printer's boy would be at the door, taking each sheet of manuscript from him as he finished it to run it round to the, uh, to the printer around the corner. He didn't even read over what he'd written. He wrote it in such a hurry. But this uh, paroxysm of diligence, which is a phrase from Keats, the paroxysm of diligence um, that produced this work is, of course, preceded uh, by a long period of apparent, apparent idleness uh, or laziness. But actually, what's going on during that time, and this is what he explores, is that the, the, the idle person is actually thinking. Um, and I suddenly saw that this laziness that I was uh, getting fed up with myself about um, could actually be the source of all my creativity. Because it's when you're lying there doing nothing, when you're prone, when you're um, in bed or uh, out for a walk, that's when you have a free flow. The actual work as a journalist later of putting those ideas down on paper is the sort of formality at the end of the whole process. So I began to think that actually um, there could be something in this, a, a positive side to idleness. And, um, and so it was that I, I had the idea of a new magazine called The Idler. Um, I went across the road to my friend Gavin, who uh, had an Apple Mac, um, and we got on with it. We started our own magazine. Luckily, soon after that, I was sacked from my job at, uh, on a magazine. So I was on the dole with really nothing to lose um, and plenty of time. So we, we, we got on with it and we started a magazine. And these books I've written, How to Be Idle and so on, um, have come out of this uh, exploration of creativity and work and laziness and idleness and all these things. Um, really looking at the, the positive sides of, uh, of idleness. Um, so the whole work, all these books and magazines and uh, articles and so on, talks, it's an attack on um, the Protestant work ethic and um, the, the great change that happened in Europe around the Reformation, um, when we changed from a, a, a more or less communal medieval society to a more individualistic society following the new uh, ways of thinking uh, of, of people like Calvin and Luther. 
Um, later, of course, we have the Industrial Revolution, and that's really when England turned from a, a sort of rural nation of kind of self-employed weavers and so on um, into, a, 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 into a, a sort of factory-based um, nation, and where you were tied down to a full-time job in the factories. Um, and that's the kind of culture I'm, I'm trying to resist, or, or at least look for alternatives to. Um, and it, what's happened as I've researched this very fascinating subject of laziness, and I've spent a long time researching it, um, it's, it's really wonderful to be able to devote your life's work to this. Um, <laughs> I found out all sorts of things. I mean, you know, uh, it's everywhere. Every philosopher and poet has praised at least the contemplative life. You know, it goes right back to Aristotle, um, and the ancient Greeks were praising the contemplative life. Epicurus praised the life of undisturbedness, where you would sort of retreat from the city, um, live in communes and grow your own vegetables and that kind of thing. Um, and even the Stoics and the Cynics, um, and these, these ancient schools of philosophy, um, wanted to use their leisure time, not just for he hedonism, which is what we tend to do today, uh, you know, to escape the grind of the nine to five and forget it, um, but to use your leisure time in a kind of constructive way for, for debate, for learning, for reading, uh, for you know, what you might call meditation, prayer, um, for, for religion and for self-development. And so th these are all the things that are actually good about idleness. So um, that's a sort of brief description of uh, my, my defense of idleness, um, which is perhaps fairly easy to do when you're a kind of slack 25-year-old um, wannabe bohemian man about town. Um, but sort of fast forward 10 years later when you've got three small children um, and you're sort of trying to make ends meet and absolutely frazzled with the exhaustion of it all. Um, how can I reconcile this idea of being idle, um, lazing around in the coffee shops and talking about uh, philosophy um, with the demands of a young family? Uh, and this is something I really struggled with for some time. Until one day when uh, I was reclining on a sunny bank opposite our house with a friend of mine who writes, or did write a column, he was sacked. He d used to write a column <laughs> called Slack Dad. Um, when he, it was just a sort of, you know, uh, a, a weekly column about how completely useless he was as a parent. So th there you had um, Slack Dad and Idle Dad, um, you know, reclining on this sunny bank. And um, I was reading D.H. Lawrence, a series of e essays by D.H. Lawrence, or one particular essay, which is extremely relevant to actually to this conference, and I, I would urge everyone to go back and take a look at it. It's called Education of the People, and it was written in uh, 1919 or thereabouts. Um, and in it, Lawrence talked about education. These issues have been around forever. I mean, they're not new issues. Um, really, what we're discussing over these two days is the balance between freedom and authority um, in children's lives, I think. Um, I'm on the side of arguing that you know, children's lives have become too rigidly controlled. There's not enough space and time for them uh, just to play or just to be um, and to develop their own self-reliance. But um, at this point, I wasn't really thinking about the children. Um, rather more selfishly, I was thinking about myself. <laughs> and. Um, uh, why I was so tired and exhausted, and why couldn't I enjoy this more? You know, family life is supposed to be fun. Um, it's certainly promoted as such by celebrities in Hello magazine. And, um, uh, but we were arguing, fighting. Uh, all, all our little dreams seemed to have evaporated. I remember when the first child was born. I remember clearly thinking, you know, this child is going to be loved. It's, not going to, it's never going to need to have a tantrum because it's going to be so loved. We won't make any of the same mistakes that are so obvious that I've seen all my friends make. You know, it's pretty clear the mistakes they make. They, 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 you know, um, if you just provide a, a, a solid foundation and give the child lots of love. So you got, had that rather kind of nauseating smugness of the, um, of the parent of the naught to one year old. Um, a smugness which is, soon evaporates over the two or three years that follow that. Um, and you find there is a reason why it's called the terrible twos and you know we're screaming at each other we're screaming at the child the child's screaming at you you're locking it in a bedroom or should you lock yourself in your room um, to get away from it um, and uh, and so and so it goes and I think this is probably the, 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 a common story around the world you know um, and uh, it's the same whether you're in Paraguay or Sydney Australia um, because it's a very lovely, clean, shiny city. I wasn't expecting everything to be so sort of shiny, but it is lovely. Um, <laughs> particularly in the, the, the Novotel where I'm staying. It's in, in incredible levels of shininess. Um, 
But um, uh, and I compare it to my own house, which is just so messy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, but actually, I think it's to be too. This is one little parenting point. I'll come back to the main um, thrust in a moment. But um, just while I think of it, uh, I did think it's it's actually uh, it's actually impolite, frankly, to be to, to be too uh, tidy at home, to have to have a clean house because it makes other mothers and fathers who come round to your house feel bad. Um, so the the polite uh, the polite thing to do within your community is, is to live in a pigsty. <laughs> Um, because then when people come round, they're like, God, well, at least it's not as bad as this. Um, so that's how I sort of justify uh, the, the, our kind of slummy household. Um, and uh, although it does sort of, it can, too, too over much mess can get you down. But I, I do think it's, you know, it's a little um, rude uh, of people to, to, to be too clean. Um, so going back to the, 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 the nature of this book, um, and in this essay about, uh, about education, um, T.H. Lawrence, you know, he, he didn't just write Lady Chatterley's Lover, he wrote a whole load of novels, famously, but he, he was also a, a social critic and a poet um, and really involved with the, the issues of his day. Um, and this was an issue then, he felt that the, 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 the schools were over-controlled over um, children and parents did too much for their children. Um, they were too fussy. And he said, uh, and they, they hovered over them too much. Um, and he said there are three rules of childcare uh, or, or of education. First rule, leave the child alone. Second rule, leave the child alone. Third rule, leave the child alone. Um, now he was saying this from the point of view, this is better from the point of view of the child, um, because from the child's point of view, the more it's left alone, the more it develops its own um, self-reliance. Now he was saying, you know, every child should be, should be able to mend its own clothes. Um, and I was like, mend its own clothes? <laughs> I mean, uh, our, our children can barely tie their own shoelaces. Or, uh, uh, a lot of children can't even put their own clothes on, um, let alone sit down with a, a needle and thread and mend them. Um, and I've seen that with you know, quite children who really should know better of six, seven years old, and their parents literally is dressing them in the morning, putting their socks on for them and stuff like that. So, um, and he was saying it would be much better for the child to develop their own self-reliance, um, and, and, um, and the way to do that actually is to completely neglect them. <laughs> Um, because, uh, of course, you have to teach them these things as well, but um, also uh, um, a bit of benign neglect is the phrase. Um, means they're more likely to look after themselves. So um, I thought, well, this sounds good. Um, <coughs> from my point of view, it's going to be a lot less work. Um, and from the children's point of view, clearly, you know, if, if D.H. Lawrence is to be believed, um, you're going to create this kind of super race of uh, very capable young children who will actually start working for you um, and making your breakfast rather than you having to be their slave. Um, and um, so I sort of enthusiastically adopted these ideas of leave them alone. Um, and that's really what the book is about. So that, 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 that was the sort of basic philosophy that, that it sprang from. Um, he, it's, it's a lovely long essay, and he, he goes into all sorts of areas. Um, he goes into education. Um, he's not quite as kind of um, laissez-faire as that uh, leave them alone might uh, first make him appear um, at first sight. When it comes to education, he was actually into very sort of old-fashioned, strict education, but just for like three or four hours a day. This would be the ideal. Um, and then the rest of the time, really, you'd be just running around in the forest and the fields and in nature. Um, so I thought, well, this is such a contrast. Probably he was talking to parents of the, that time um, who were over-anxious and over-worried. Um, and so I thought, well, these ideas could really, really usefully be revisited now because um, I know my own parents can't believe how fussy uh, my generation of, of, of parents are. They didn't have the verb parenting. It was just a word. It hadn't been verbed by, at that point. Um, and although they took some interest in our education, I mean, we were sort of more or less left alone um, to sort of get on with it on our own because the baby boomer generation were just so selfish. Um, <laughs> And my parents were incredibly selfish, and they still are very selfish, and won't help with childcare. And um, <laughs> but the, the 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 recent decline in the quality of grandparents is a different talk, which I'll give. Um, 
That's been very sad. Yeah, get the grandparents involved. They don't want to. They're too busy spending your inheritance on cruises and things. Um, so, um, so this is the idea, leave them alone. Um, and uh, I'm just going to go through sort of five of the, the sort of leave them alone type tips um, in the seven minutes and 51 seconds I've got left. Um, one of the chapters says, you know, bring back child labour. Uh, which, which I mentioned earlier, and it's a shame that those laws went out in the late 19th century, um, thanks to people like Dickens. Um, uh, but I think it's important for the, for the children to work for you, and if you read some of these sort of anthropological accounts of uh, family life in you know, other cultures, um, like The Continuum Concept, which is actually a lovely book, and books like that, um, the anthropologists say that um, a new child born into the family is not seen as uh, an additional encumbrance and cost, but a, a welcome addition to the labour force of the household. <laughs> so, again, I've enthusiastically adopt that. I mean, it's incredibly difficult um, and a real struggle because children resist um, this idea of them working um, so forcefully. I mean, it's all right when they're small because they haven't quite discovered that um, uh, hoovering is not uh, play. <laughs> Um, and they think it's quite fun, and so you can, you can take advantage of that till they're about three. Um, and I, I did have this idea that I would sort of like sing while I was hoovering or something, to um, vacuuming, I should say, um, to, uh, to sort of fool the children into thinking that this was fun um, and a game that they would like to play. And perhaps you could do the same thing with washing the dishes. Um, I tried that. That worked for a little bit. Um, but now the only way I can really... Uh, the, the method I now use is shouting. Um, and screaming at them to help and um, running upstairs and grabbing them and pulling them back downstairs just after we finished eating um, and forcing them to, um, to help me to do the dishes. But actually, if you do that a few times, it starts to become a, a, a bit of a habit. I mean, obviously, they'd, they'd, rather, um, they'd rather not. They'd rather go and watch The Simpsons next door or whatever. Um, just a, a couple of words on the screens. Um, we did actually get rid of the television for about five years, which is great. Um, and, uh, but you know, after sort of four years of in intensive lobbying um, from all three of the children about why it was so awful they didn't have a television, um, we did eventually give in. And I, I went to the um, shopping centre with my eldest son, Arthur, who's 11, and we came back with a sort of new flat screen television. Um, you know, we tried to be one of those kind of organic families who, you know, lots of outdoor play and um, so on, bake your own bread, and the children hate it. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, you, you know, you sort of eventually give in, um, and um, Arthur, at the end, when, I, when we brought this television back home, Arthur said, that's the best day of my life so far, Daddy. Um, <laughs> What about all that time we had natural play down by the beach and stuff? You know, it's like, no, I don't really like that. Um, so we, we sort of gave in a bit. Um, and, uh, but when Arthur was smaller, he was always, you know, we were always dragging him off the computer. Um, and he would say things like, you know, I'm bored. I need some entertainment. Um, that really horrified me because I thought, well, what happened to just play? You know, when the children just be shoved outside and just play, uh, which actually they're quite good at. Why do they need these screens and these, this, this kind of this input all the time? Um, so I tried to resist that, and um, I've got all sorts of you know, lovely ideas about how you do that, limit it to an hour a day, um, two hours a day, one and a half, or whatever. We never quite sort of managed to time it properly, and, um, and actually sometimes it's quite welcome because they're sort of, you know, just quietly playing in the corner and not disturbing you. So you think, well, good, I'll go and do some emailing or something. Um, but then what I do, this is all completely wrong, but, um, rather than sort of calmly having a, a family meeting and discussing how many hours or minutes they should be allowed um, on the screens, what we do is just suddenly lose our temper, run into a, get off the screen, get off it, you know. Um, <laughs> what are you doing? You're ruining your own childhood. Um, and just like, so, and Victoria's actually thrown, the, you know, broken the screen in a fit of kind of anger. Um, that's not, not a very good way of doing it, I don't think. Um, but I suppose they get the point. Um, <laughs> I've just got four more tips, which I'll try and run through quickly. Um, one great thing, I think, is camping weekends, because it means you can drink and smoke um, <laughs> while, while doing the childcare, because um, you're outdoors. And, um, and also, they, they can sort of fall asleep around the, around the fire. Um, and the other thing that's true is if you get, you know, the more of you, the better, really. I mean, um, 
we got through those early years by having lots of friends around. They brought their families around, so you got adults to talk to, and they got children to play with. Um, and if you get a gang of children, actually, they do tend to play and get off the screen. It's when they're on their own, this sort of isolation um, that the modern world encourages. We're all on our own, on our, you know, tweeting or whatever. Um, but if you get a big gang of people around, for parents and children, it's great. And a camping weekend is absolutely fantastic. You know, sort of three or four families. Um, really, everybody's happy because the parents talk to each other. And the children will leave you alone. Um, because, um, you know, I sort of expect, uh, if I'm going to leave them alone, I expect them to leave me alone. Um, <laughs> rather than sort of hassling me, Daddy, can we have this and that? Um, you know, can we have a hamster or whatever it is? Um, the other thing is lots of sleep um, for the parents is really important. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of undervalued, but um, you, you've just got to have a nap. And when um, every day or, you know, um, when, when Victoria had... We sort of finally got the hang of this on the third baby. Um, because we're two cranky people um, underslept. It's just an absolute hell. Um, so finally, with number three, I slept in the other room um, during the pregnancy and, and when he was born. But then we also arranged for Victoria... We got someone to come and help for a month, and I was also at home, just after she'd had the baby. Um, and we did this old-fashioned thing where, you know, you're excused domestic duties for a month, the mother is. Um, and she can really just lie in bed with the baby and eat chocolate um, <laughs> while the others do that. Well, I thought that was, that was quite a good system. We didn't really mind, you know, as long as she gets right back into it when that month's over. <laughs> um, then we also have days at home. Um, you know, sort of resist the temptation to go and spend a lot of money on a theme park. I mean, I know the children always want that. Can we go to Watermouth Castle? But, um, you, you know, if you just sit around at home and literally do nothing and with no expectations, things do happen of their own accord and you can sort of play board games and wrestling games with them and these kinds of things that don't cost anything. Because um, the other problem is the high cost of all this stuff that you've got to buy and the days out and the driving and the travelling. Um, so just to, to do nothing at home um, is a sort of eco-friendly option um, and, uh, and, it, and it, it's very low cost as well. So I've just got 49, 8, 7, 6 seconds left. Um, a final thought for the parents is just is really to, to have a really good book always on the go. Um, so you can always retreat and go and read it and um, ignore the children. Um, and sort of be happy in your own small world and just hope that they ignore you. Thanks very much.